Hello and welcome to our talk, Unlocking Kubernetes Intelligence. I am Damien Kurochko, a senior DevOps consultant in AWS. And this talk will be conducted by me and also Mateusz. Hello everyone, I'm Mateusz Zaremba. I am DevOps architect at AWS. Okay, let's, let's get started. Uh, we'll be talking about unlocking Kubernetes intelligence with uh, foundational models. And we'll need a bit of intro uh, before we start, but very soon after the intro, there will be demo. Um, I can promise you that, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, but about the intro, what we'll talk about today is essentially two things. We'll talk about one, a tool that uh, we'd like to introduce to you that helps with integration of artificial intelligence into your Kubernetes experience. And the second thing we'll talk about is uh, how we contributed to this tool and what our contribution gives you, uh, what can give to you, to your company, to your team. But before we go into the demo, uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of technical introduction. Uh, and let me ask you, let, let's see the show of hands, who, uh, have not, who have heard about LLMs or large language models before? Okay, I can see some hands. Uh, some people did not raise their hands, don't worry, uh, I will explain uh, a bit. And for the people who know, uh, it's gonna just be a minute, so don't worry, uh, we'll go into the uh, technical stuff back again soon. So what are LLMs, or large language models? Those are essentially big uh, artificial intelligence models uh, that, uh, con that convert um, that accept text as an input and output also text. And they are trained on a very big uh, bodies of text. You can think of Wikipedia, Stack Overflow, you can think of documentation. And they, by, by the process of training, they get to know this. And what they also get to know is how to interpret text. Uh, and since they accept text, they can also accept, they can also understand the context. So let's, let's see an example. This actual example of one of the large language models uh, that I asked, what should I see in Tokyo? And then I asked it also to answer in one sentence. And this is also pretty important, so that you can not only understand your input, what do you want to see, but also how do you want to frame the answer? It is the concept uh, of like understanding the, the shape, the, the text, the, the syntax that you want the output to be it. And let's see the example answer. And it actually answered to, to explore a couple of districts in, in Tokyo and uh, see a temple. And honestly, I've been there. I verified this. It, uh, this is pretty good advice. So that's, that's essentially all you need to know about the LLMs before we proceed to the next step. And the next step is let's think about how AI can help us as a technical people. And I wanted to highlight two, uh, two particular topics there. First one, it's a pair programmer. So you can think of the AI, you can use the AI tools like GitHub, Copilot, like AWS Code Whisper. Uh, you can use it to help you program. So if you have not used, used it before, the way it looks, you just write your code and based on the context, based on the surrounding code, it can help you generate more code. So for example, you can actually ask it to uh, capitalize every first letter uh, in the sentence of every word. And they can pretty easily con actually generate such a code. And the second bit ties to what I said before. So the second bit is the source of knowledge. And what I mean by source of knowledge is it's, a very, easy, it's very easy to query the knowledge of the LLM because you don't need to hit the right keywords, you don't need to uh, type a specific syntax you as a person just can use your natural language to ask it for something and you will get the answer back. And as I already said, they're trained on very big sources of, of information and we can get this, answer, this information back very easily. And also we can say in what form and what shape we want the answer. Maybe we want to explain it in an easy way or maybe we want to get steps of something. So how, how to solve something. And this is actually uh, what we want to talk about today, using the AI as a source of knowledge. But we can go one step further. Uh, I expect that a couple of people here are SREs or DevOps, and what we do like is automation. We don't want to rely on having, an, uh, having to take an action and remembering 
uh, the action that we need to take every single time. If we have a repetitive procedure, we would like to automate this. So let's think how we can automate using the AI knowledge and how we can skip this copy pasting. So that's the one question. And then there is a second question. How can we ensure the privacy? So probably many of you used similar tools, to, uh, some tools uh, like the LLMs, powered by LLMs, using some chats uh, backed by the AI. But where does this information that we enter go? And as, a, as a employees, as a teams, as a companies, we want to ensure that this information goes into specific place. And quite often, uh, it would be actually the best if, we, if it does not leave our network, if we have control over this, uh, like the, where the input goes and what the model can do. And what we want to show you today is the answer uh, for, for those questions in Kubernetes. Uh, and the answer is Kate's GPT. Kate's GPT is an open source tool that helps you stay inside your uh, natural environment when you're working with code. So command line interface. And then with the privacy uh, aspect, our contribution allows you to keep the traffic, keep the information that you enter under your control. And here I also wanted to give a shout out to Alex Jones, who is the creator of this project. He also uh, helped with our contribution by reviewing uh, and verifying our pull, re pull request. So thank you, Alex. And with this bit of introduction, um, I'm finished. Uh, and I like to give the word to Damian, who will tell us a story. Yeah, thank you very much, <laughs> Mateusz. So we wanted to uh, demonstrate how you can use KGPT to uh, speed up a little bit your, um, let's say, uh, the working environment and also debugging what's, uh, what's wrong. So uh, by this, I, I have a, uh, let's say that, um, so first of all, uh, to make it working, we had uh, I, I needed to prepare some uh, infrastructure underneath, and uh, how uh, to set it up uh, we'll cover later on. Right now, I want to uh, show you how to use KGPT. So I have a deployment, and let's say I'm a developer that I've got a task to change something in my application. Uh, and also this application normally runs on production on Kubernetes cluster. So to have the similar environment, I, I sp uh, spin up the cluster locally on my laptop and I want to just run that application. But for some reason, it's not working. Uh, and also we see the status is pending. Uh, probably for seasoned administrators, uh, Kubernetes administrators and also knowledgeable people, that will mean a lot and we would need, uh, we, we, we know what to do next with this probably kubectl describe and also check the pod status and so on and so on. Uh, but here I would like to show you how to uh, use KGPT uh, analyze to analyze our cluster and also show us the old problems that KGPT uh, found. So right now we see two different problems. Normally when we would use uh, kubectl describe probably we will find one problem later on we will uh, I don't know, maybe copy and paste this error message to Stack Overflow or something like that. Here we have a, uh, exactly information what's wrong on uh, what's, uh, uh, let's say, not in perfect state right now on whole cluster. And as well, normally we would need to go through one uh, error by one and dis uh, discover it by ourselves. Here we have it, let's say, on the screen uh, together uh, on, on one run. And what we see, we see that so one kind worker is not healthy and also something is wrong with our uh, pod uh, uh, and also its error shows that uh, it cannot be scheduled on three nodes. So one is not healthy, then probably the next one uh, should pick it up, but it's not working. This, uh, for this uh, moment, we didn't involve any AI. So this is pure codified experience in KGPT. So KGPT knows what needs to be checked to know uh, that, for example, pod is not healthy. Um, right now, let's uh, include some AI in it and let's try to explain why those problems are there and also mm, uh, let's get some solutions, uh, recommendations for this. 
And right now what is going on uh, under the hood is that these errors are sent to our LLM and LLM will answer us with, uh, with, with the proposal what can be the solution for your error. So basically on the kind worker, um, the solution is that we should check the logs of the kubelet and later on, if necessary, restart the kubelet. Uh, this error, uh, so this solution, of course, whenever I will uh, send it once again, the LLM model will once again analyze the problem and send me back the answer and it can be different each time I will send it. Uh, okay, so let's restart my, uh, my node to make it healthy. Uh, and the second problem, let's, let's take a look on that as well. So the node um, it's insufficient CPU, try rest scheduling, uh, check the instance CPU resources available. All right, so let's have a look on my definition of my deployment and also the CPU part. Uh, okay, so we required a, a CPU that is 250 CPUs. That is much too, uh, too, too big number for my laptop. So let's make it much smaller then uh, and redeploy uh, this uh, this deployment all right so both should be fixed but it's still pending okay so let's once again analyze our infrastructure and check what's going on and why it's still pending and change, right? I think th this was... Okay. One present, all right. Still pending. It's weird, to be honest. Let's investigate it then. The demo effect. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think uh, okay. minus F is deleted. Uh, I think I know. Am I, I think I'm in the wrong directory then. I'm changing the different deployment. Let's have a look, yes, okay, sorry. Now it will work. I was changing the wrong file and applying this, the same one without any changes, sorry about that. So that's why we need the automation, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, now it's created, okay. Okay, all right, so right now we have another error. So this shows that we, we have next step, let's say, right? So let's analyze this once again. Okay, no problem detected because it didn't show up yet. But let, let's see now. All right, so we have a Nginx with failed start. Okay, so let's describe this. Back off, restarting. So right now, even here, we don't see any, any, anything that, that would be, uh, let's say, meaningful for us. And I wanted also to show uh, the feature from KGPT that it's uh, quite new. Uh, it's uh, related to the filters and analyzers. And also uh, I wanted to show GPT filter filters list. So 
So basically how KGPT works is that we have a list of analyzers that can analyze our cluster in depending on the different, let's say, angles, right? So we, sh we saw that the, uh, it can analyze the pods and nodes as well, but there is a bunch of things that, that it can analyze. And also some of the um, analyzers un are not turned on by default because maybe it's not useful for you. And here I wanted to show you uh, the analyzer, which is logs. Uh, analyzer to, to logs. Let's add it to our configuration. And right now, KGPT will be able to analyze not only Kubernetes from the Kubernetes point, uh, point of view, but also it will be able to analyze our logs from, uh, the, from uh, containers. And let's analyze it right now. So right now, the uh, KGPT found even six problems. Uh, and also, let's see what it will find. <clears throat> uh, so those six problems probably will be uh, from all namespaces. Uh, as on this demo, uh, we want to focus mostly on the default namespace. Let's limit it because we have, for, ex for example, from cube system scheduler, some, some logs and so on and so on. Let's filter it out to just default namespace. Of course, we can limit it to only services, for example, or only for pods and so on, so on. So we see in the logs that um, also what I wanted uh, to point out is very often probably on our pods, on containers, we will have a huge uh, a long uh, list of the, uh, let's say, logs and er errors. And it's very tricky sometimes to find the correct line, which will be meaningful. Here, uh, KGPT is checking which one, which line uh, is uh, uh, with the exact error. And here we, we see that the container cannot bind to port 80. So let's check our the definition of the, our pod. And we see that in the security context, we are dropping or blocking the bind service uh, capability. So this is blocking that container for doing uh, what it wants. So let's, uh, let's change it and apply this change. All right. So one is terminating and one is just to clear it up. and apply. All right, so now it's running. So with port forwarding, let's have a look if it's working. Almost there. So right now we have 404. So we are inside the container, Nginx is working, but the misconfiguration of the Nginx is still uh, not perfect. So let's once again uh, analyze our cluster and here it will show that the Q, uh, KGPT is able to get into the logs and f found the error, the exact error that is the latest one. And also uh, it will show you the uh, example of solution, right? So here we have an error with the, uh, the index is not found. And the perfect, the solution is that to check if file exists and so on, so on. We see that the path is not correct. It, it has a typo. And also I've prepared the fix for that on the, uh, let's say this, this is the Docker file of uh, our Nginx with the typo. And I've prepared the newer version, uh, which is uh, with, with fix of that. So let's change the version of our pod. and apply it. Okay, it's configured with pod wording and it works. Uh, so application is working. And uh, this is very basic application that is only print screen uh, from uh, the release of KGPT uh, that shows that the feature that uh, with Mateusz prepar uh, we've prepared, uh, which was the adding the SageMaker provider to KGPT, uh, was released. And also uh, this version is quite old. It was one month ago uh, added, but right now we have even three new versions. So that shows that this project uh, rapidly uh, grow. And yeah, this, uh, this is the demo part. 
let's go back to our presentation then. So you saw how KGPT can be used uh, by, uh, by someone, developer or uh, someone else. Let's uh, have a look how to configure it and what is needed to make it working. So uh, for sure, we, uh, from, from our laptop, we need to have a connectivity to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, KGPT uses kubeconfig that is used by Kube Control. Uh, so you need to have a configured context uh, locally. And also you need to have a connectivity to uh, LLM model that you pick because there is a bunch of, uh, of them uh, that will be covered as well later on. In our example, we used uh, Amazon SageMaker in AWS. And in this case, we, uh, to have a connectivity to SageMaker, we just need AWS CLI configured and have credentials, temporal credentials uh, locally. Uh, to install uh, on uh, laptop, uh, KGPT CLI uh, is provided by a package. Uh, for the Mac, it's easier uh, mostly uh, by, uh, to install it by Homebrew. Uh, but of course, uh, the binaries for, for other uh, OSs are also prepared for uh, Debian-based and also Red Hat-based uh, OSs and also for Windows with each um, uh, with each uh, version, uh, there is a, a list of, of the packages that you can install. In terms of the configuration, uh, KGPT, uh, of course, uh, has a very good help. And um, also, it's very um, uh, useful to, uh, in, in terms of the listing and also uh, adding the backends. So we can list uh, all backends and also to add, uh, for example, uh, Amazon SageMaker, we need to provide two elements. One is in which region it was deployed, and second thing is that uh, in which endpoint name it has. Uh, and this part also will be covered in the part of the SageMaker. Uh, as well, everything what we will do with CLI is saved in the config file, and we can change it uh, later on uh, if needed, and some other parameters also are saved there that can be also changed uh, in CLI or in the file. Uh, okay, but CLI is very good uh, for temporary and maybe locally to work on uh, right now problems, right? And in terms of the production, very often we don't have even uh, access to a production cluster. So for, for this purpose, um, KGPT operator was created. So we can install KGPT inside our Kubernetes cluster uh, have it running all, all the time and also based on the, our configuration uh, create a uh, reports uh, which is called the results of what was going wrong in specific time. We can install Q KGPT operator by Helm chart and also uh, configure uh, it by Helm values file. Uh, additionally, with the KGPT operator, we are able to create Prometheus service monitor if you use uh, Kube Prometheus uh, stack and also Grafana dashboard that will visualize the reports from KGPT, what was going wrong in the past and also graph if the problems uh, are growing or, or we are fixing them. Additionally, uh, KGPT has uh, um, webhooks that we can configure to notify us on the Slack and for those interested in platform engineering and in, uh, uh, the backstage plugin is also created for KGPT. Uh, this part covered KGPT, uh, so we know how to install it, how to configure it, how, how to use it. Now we will switch a little bit to SageMaker part and also the backends of LLMs, which will be covered by Mateusz. Thank you, Damian. What we'll talk about is um, the AI backends and also we'll mention our contribution, which is the SageMaker backend. Uh, but let's, let's go into the backends first. Um, so what are the AI backends? KGPT uh, by itself does not know how to resolve those issues. KGPT knows how to analyze, what to check for, but it does not know how to fix them. The AI backends is the place that tells the KGPT how to how to, what information shared to us, so shares uh, information how to fix those issues. Uh, the AI backends are basically behind those comments that you run explain and then the KGPT sends the information to the backend 
and then uh, the backend response. And as I mentioned before, it's powered by a large uh, language model, so it receives text and response with text, in our case, is how to fix the issue. Um, so let's talk about uh, SageMaker backend itself and what is in our contribution that we thought it's important to share with you that increases the privacy, increases the control of the model that, that you use. So SageMaker backend architecture essentially consists of a couple of elements and when we run uh, the explain command we are the person here on the left side, here on the left side, and then we're going from the left to the right and I'll explain what's happening. So first, uh, we hit the SageMaker endpoint. This is the instance that's running all the time, or could be a couple of instances, that has the, the uh, LLM on board and is responding to your, uh, to your requests. This LLM uh, endpoint, this SageMaker endpoint, and by the way, SageMaker is AWS service for uh, machine learning, so uh, that, that's why the SageMaker is repeated a couple of times. And here the SageMaker endpoint is just constantly running with, with your model. Then uh, on the, next to the right is the SageMaker model. What it means is that this SageMaker uh, endpoint takes the model from the model registry. And the SageMaker model is association of uh, model artifacts and the container image and potentially more metadata about the model. So what the artifact means. Artifact is the weights for the model. It's the actual model. It's the packaged model that we want to load into the container. So that's the container image that we want to load into the container and the container will tell it how to serve the model. Uh, and those two, this information together, uh, so container image and artifacts, plus potentially more metadata if you'd like to, creates the SageMaker model. And then we can uh, create, from the SageMaker model, we can create SageMaker endpoint. Uh, and in this case, what the SageMaker backend gives you, it gives you the power to control the SageMaker endpoint. You can also replace the artifacts and the image to whatever you would like to. So you have control over the network, you have control over the image, you have control over the artifacts. Essentially every bit of the stack you have control over. But in this case, we still have this, this part that the request potentially comes from the outside, right? But we can keep everything inside uh, our network if we go the operator way. So in, ca in case uh, we have our cluster on EKS, or essentially just in AWS, you can have the operator uh, on board inside your network, and then the request may not even leave your network. And again, here as well, you're uh, in power of every single element of this, uh, of this diagram, and you can change ev everything you want. And then uh, I'd like to explain to you how you can uh, uh, how you can deploy it yourself. So how you can have this this entire stack that I showed you here, this backend, uh, yourself. How you can create it and and have it running in your in your uh, infrastructure. So for this we need a short detour. Uh, we will go into the cloud development kit. I will have a short introduction into what cloud development kit is. And cloud development kit is is a, a kit from AWS that you can use as infrastructure as code. It's an infrastructure as code tool that with the command CDK deploy will convert your code into actual infrastructure, into actual cloud resources. So let's see the example. And in this example, I'm creating S3 bucket. And for those who don't know what S3 bucket is, it's a object storage in, in AWS. And it will create, if we write this code, run CDK deploy, CDK will actually take this understand what infrastructure you'd like to deploy and deploy it into your AWS account. So with this information, we can actually deploy our backend. So deploy your own backend with the LLM on board it. So to deploy it yourself, you need a couple of steps. The first step is the, to prepare the environment. You will need the, in, in our case, we use Python, so you will need Python, you will need uh, CDK, and you will need to authenticate to your AWS account. Then you can clone the repo that we prepared for you. So this repo contains this sample code uh, that actually powered our, our demo. So you can use this backend. We use the same backend as we are showing here. Then you install dependencies from the, from the project and then you run CDK deploy. And after some time, you will see something like this. And here you can see it took quite some time, 460 seconds. So don't worry if it's not instantaneous, it's, it's still going, it takes quite a bit. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight one piece here. 
this one piece is the endpoint name. As the output, you will see in your command line model endpoint stack endpoint name. And here, important thing, this string will be, will be different for you. Uh, this is just a unique name that it's created when we do CDK deploy for our endpoint. And this is the name that Damian mentioned before that we need to specify uh, when configuring the backend. So this is just a unique name in our account uh, of the endpoint that we deployed. So if you go to your AWS account, you will see such endpoint running. So this is how we deploy it, and then we can test it. So let's test it. There is a file in the repository called invoke SageMaker. You can run it with Python. And the example is, and that's, that's actually input the output that, that I actually run against this AI backend. Write a hello world program in Python 3. Let's see the answer. Sure, here's a hello world program in Python 3. Well, yeah, it is hello world program in Python. So you can see, you can verify if your backend is working by running this file. You can also change the prompt if you would like to. And with, with this, we, know, we already know that our AI backend is working. So we can edit the deployment. So as I said, you're in charge of the infrastructure. You can change to anything you want. So let's take a look at those two files, app.py and cdk.json. I have parameterized a couple of values there. Uh, so we'll first look at the package name. So what actually specifies which model I deploy. I take existing model package name, and in uh, cdk.json you can see I take existing Llama 2 model, but here the model is not important, the exact one that we used. The point is that you can change it to whatever you would like to, and you can run your own model as a backend. Then also we can specify the instance type that powers the endpoint. In, my ca in our case, we also specify the default for you that you can use, and it's working well. And then the third thing that we can also cha change and specify is the instance count I defined it to one for starters, but as I said, all those values you can change. You can change the infrastructure, the code is yours, right? You, you can go into the GitHub, clone it, and change it to whatever, do whatever you would like to. And with this, basically, you all can already edit quite a lot in the deployment. If you liked more, you can take a look at the stack.py and change the, actual, the, the infrastructure. And once we are done with uh, playing with it, changing it, we can destroy it such that we remove the instances if you if you want, don't want to have them running because they're running the endpoint is running all the time. We can destroy it and simply CDK destroy. It will take a moment and after some time you will see model endpoints are destroyed. And this actually covers the end of the life cycle of CDK. And with this, you're ready to deploy your own AI backend. So we can now go into key takeaways. It will be wrapping now. Uh, and there are three points we would like you to remember about this after, after this talk. Damian, the first one yeah. is yours. <laughs> Click. Yeah. Codified DevOps ancestry knowledge. So in KGPT, uh, it's not the magic. Uh, underneath, it's codified elements and analyzers. And uh, 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 you can check uh, each of them uh, on the GitHub. And basically, KGPT knows how to check if specific element uh, is working well or, or not. Uh, so this is the one point and another. Sure. The second one is faster debugging powered by LLMs. So this can cut down the time of you debugging things by quite a lot. And it powers it by uh, the fact that it powers it by LLM is the uh, part where it also saves you the search. So you don't no longer need to copy paste anywhere. Uh, you can just do it right in the CLI. And there's also a third point uh, that I wanted to highlight. You can host it and control it, uh, control the model yourself. So you don't have to use someone's endpoint, you can control it. And this, is, this gives you a lot of power. And those are all the three points I would like you to remember after, after this talk. Those are, the, in our opinion, the key takeaways. Thanks a lot for attention, and we are open to questions. And then one more thing I'd like you to ask you, if you could scan this feedback form uh, with, your, with your phone, there will be a feedback form very quick, three questions, all optional, and let's see if there are <coughs> any questions. Yeah, please. Oh, sorry, wait, wait. Oh, could you repeat the question for Sven? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, sure. Uh, which? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Future question. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yes. So, yeah. I wonder actually in this demo, the exact backend model, what you are using, like which model exactly you guys are using. Uh, for example, if we use any public model, uh, and also, sorry, and also if we want to actually um, reproduce this, and we 
we want to design our own model, can we use any like public model and have the same result? And uh, can we deploy it by using our own, like instead of SageMaker, can we use, for example, K serve or something, like serving on our own like free service? Sure, okay, so there is a question if uh, you can actually reproduce this uh, and then also if you could change the model. Uh, so the answer is the actual model that we use is the one that you would deploy if you clone the repository that I mentioned. So this is actually the model. We use Llama 2, uh, but you're free to change it. Uh, and with reproducibility, it's with LLMs, they, they generate every time they generate something can be slightly different. It can be, so it's not necessarily you will get the same answer but you'll get probably a similar answer. So absolutely, yes, you can reproduce the experience, the specific solution that it gives you, not necessarily the same, the same. but uh, we actually use the backend from the code that we showed you and shared with you. And at the end of the presentation, we already shared it, uh, so you can see it uh, uh, in the schedule. The presentation is shared there, and there is uh, a resource page at the end. You can see all the resources with also the GitHub repo linked. And of course, uh, SageMaker is one of the backends. You can even have a local uh, deployed model, your own model, and also use it as a backend. And there is a bunch, list of, of other backends that you can use uh, in KGPT. So it's not only SageMaker, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, you just said that oh, we can change any models uh, we like to, but how do you make sure uh, the output is correct? So, uh, how to ensure the if the answer, uh, output is correct? Well, you need to trust your model. So, you can first choose a different model, the one that you're comfortable with. That's the first. Uh, that's the first thing that you you could do. And then there are also each model has also configurable variables. In our case, I mean, if you could go back to the config uh, with temperature and top K, um, yeah, I think it was there was in the slide. Uh, so oh. there, you can also change how it uh, how it works, like how it uh, generates the answer. So you can also modify it such that it chooses only the words that it's more sure that should be, there are the right words. So there is a temperature and top K uh, that can be changed. But yes, it's it's a generative model, so you need to have some ca some caution and some some judgment whether what it says is actually true. It may produce incorrect answers, uh, but essentially you can switch to a different model, the one that you or your team or your company will feel comfortable with. Thank you. I think you mean this one, right? Yeah, so sorry, top, top P, P and, and temperature. temperature. Yeah, no, top K. Yeah, top P and temperature. You can change it to minimize the hallucination that LLM will generate, right? And also, uh, those I think you can change. And also, you can use different backends in the same time that KGPT can answer you from different models, for example, at once, that you can pick which answer is the best. Are there any more questions? Yeah, there is a question. Does KGP, does it work with K3S? Or does it only work with K8S? K3S, like this? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I know this too. It's like a lightweight Kubernetes. That's, that's um, a uh, if you are able, if you are able to, um, you know, connect to that as a normal Kubernetes cluster, that, yes. Uh, it needs basically... Okay. Sorry, I mean, uh, we did not repeat the ah, question. Sorry. Yes. So the question was, is KGPT is able to work with K3S? So uh, the smaller, uh, let's say, implementation of Kubernetes. And uh, I didn't check it, but I think yes. If you are able to use K, uh, Kube Control, then uh, without any additional configuration, it should work. See, we have one more minute, so that means if there's any last question. Okay, I don't see any question. E there's resources. If you did not scan yet, please do scan the feedback <laughs> form. It's really just a couple of seconds and we'll f it would be a l very important for us if you could leave some feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs>